Today, the title is Idea to Implementation, so journey of AI applications towards real-time stress phenotyping. So we are not there in real sense with real-time phenotyping, but we have one example where we are moving towards a real-time real uh, stress phenotyping. So in 2014, almost 10 years, it will be next year, uh, we started with this idea that can we uh, provide vision to these robots or drones so that we can do automated stress phenotyping in fields in real time. And we are still working on that idea. So, so we came up with this ICQP paradigm. Uh, so if a farmer is interested uh, to identify uh, a stress in his field, uh, he or she can fly a drone. And if it has a vision, it can identify a stress, which stress it is. And classification is that the uh, farmer already knows that, hey, we have this iron deficiency chlorosis and he wants to know, hey, it's medium, small, then he, he or she can also classify. And quantification is when we are interested in quantifying that what is the severity. Uh, in this case, we don't want to spray because it is deficient, already soil is deficient, and uh, but maybe it's a disease, we want to spray fungicide or insect, we want to mitigate the stress by spraying some insecticide. And prediction is when we have a trained algorithm which can identify, classify, and quantify with our uh, historical data, weather data, we can predict in, in future that maybe uh, this looks like the stress might come. So we started uh, around uh, in 2014 uh, with this idea uh, for giving vision to these robots, to these drones. Uh, and we started formulating this question and we, we picked initially some basic uh, problems, which were easy in the sense that, uh, which were not too tough. We, we wanted to make sure in 2014 that, hey, image-based phenotyping works. And if it works, what we see and how to you know, uh, decipher uh, the, the output we are seeing. So we had these uh, problems, we, which we started picking one by one, and we saw these results and started evaluating, selected sample solutions. And as we were selecting, we also knew that uh, at that time, uh, ML was you know, also progressing. We were also getting more data. So we kept re-evaluating. We went back to the problem with another algorithm and started seeing into the, those problems more in depth. And right now, I would say we are in small scale implementation stage, uh, uh, phase three, and future is like we, we might go with some of the tools and te technology for large scale implementation. And later on, uh, we might go for some tools with commercial scale implementation. So as, as we moved from, uh, initially we started, as I said, we started with traditional ML, where we started with simple problems and sim simpler models. And as uh, we got hold of the data, we started going into a deeper uh, and more complex uh, ML uh, problems and complex problem, uh, complex solutions. And soon we realized when we started, data collection uh, or big data uh, was, was a bottleneck. Collecting a data was bottleneck. As we move forward in the middle, we reached a time where data analysis was a bottleneck, especially image-based, because this is a new thing in 2014-15. And then ML uh, or DL came into for the rescue. But then with the big data came the data annotation problem, so how to annotate data. And uh, so we uh, worked on uh, how can we do, use active learning, uh, human in the loop uh, uh, to, to label so that these deep learning models can perform better. And after working for several years, uh, the recent paper which came doing more with less. Uh, so the, the idea of self-supervised learning. So how we can uh, do uh, annotation of these big, bigger data set. So I would uh, touch the base, what is self-supervised learning? So self-supervised machine learning is uh, a combination of unsupervised plus uh, supervised learning. So basically in supervised learning, we need a lot of da data, but in case of unsuper uh, in self-supervised learning, uh, we can uh, create uh, labels or annotations. So basically if we have to differentiate a cat with a dog, in an initial stage, we call it a pretext task. So instead of differentiating cat from a dog, what model is doing it, it is generating labels. So it is trying to rotate maybe an image from 0, 8, uh, uh, 90, 180, 270. And while it is rotating, it is also learning the underlying features of these images. And this is where we are creating tons of labels. So in initial phase is basically uh, creating uh, the, the supervised way, but this is not, uh, these labels are not uh, uh, the, the end task. When the model is uh, trained on these uh, artificial labels or the, in pretext tasks, it is also learning the underlying features of these images. And in final stage, what we call it downstream task, whatever the features it has learned, it can be transferred using a simpler uh, supervised classifier with less number of images. So this is where 
uh, generation of labels come, but labels are not uh, directly uh, to the uh, downstream task of classification to a cat or dog, but it is. it could be a rotation, it could be changing an image to a more brighter image or uh, color image into a, a black and white. So these are uh, various pretest tasks you can create. So that idea, uh, so it, the one thing happened since uh, 2014, I've been working on diseases, plant diseases. But in 2020, something interesting happened uh, that I was working, I'm a breeder also. So I was working on this plant-based protein crop and we found uh, in 2020, we had an insect problem. And I never thought of working on insect, but in 2020, after seeing a lot of insect, I thought, let's uh, start working on insect too. So anyhow, uh, in 2020, uh, we collected around 30,000 images of 30 species of insect, which is huge because collecting uh, these, uh, going into the uh, field and collecting, it's, 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 uh, it's a lot of work. But the data is not sufficient because it just, we have 30, 000, 30 species and images are just, just 30,000, it's not big data. So we can apply this ICQP paradigm to insect too because uh, machine learning can identify, can help identify these various insects. It can classify whether it's a pest, it's a predator, it's a pollinator, or it's a decomposer. And we can also use machine learning to quantify. So this ICQP paradigm fits perfectly into this context or any other stress context. So as I said, in, in, in Iowa, we collected around 30,000 species. While this student, so this work is done in collaboration of Dr. Bhaskar, and I, I co-guide this student, Shivani, who's an engineering student, and she did this work. So while we were training this model on 30 species with 30,000 images, the student said, hey, I'm using INET weight. I said, what is INET? He said, I don't know. The weights are available. I was just training the model. So that evening, I went back to home and I said, looked into what is INET? And we hit the jackpot. We came to know INET is I naturalist data set. And it has 70 million images of class insecta. From 70 million uh, insecta image, uh, we didn't have, you know, at that time, uh, breadth to deal with 70,000. So uh, there is also this INET uh, challenge 2021 where they use uh, some 2,000 species uh, from some, uh, this is the one, uh, this uh, 660K data set. So we started working with that. So as I said, working with the, any biological problem like stresses, there are a lot of challenges. And challenges are fun because this is where you like to work uh, to, to get rid of them. So one of the biggest challenge when we are working with insect class uh, is class imbalance. So we have uh, classes, we have long tail uh, distribution where we have classes like Monarch, which could be like 300,000 images. And we have classes where we have images like 38 images in case of bush cricket. So how to deal with that? We also have a challenge where we have similar looking insects, which are uh, insect could be a pest, but the other could be predator. So a very good example is ladybird beetle. So till uh, I started working on this uh, data, I thought that all the ladybirds are our, our friend. Mm. <laughs> but when I dig deeper into this data that we came to know, Epilacna beetle or Hadda beetle, they all are pest. They are pest and brinjal, potato. So they look like ladybird beetle, but they are not. There could be that these sting bugs, they look very similar. Like a, a layman, if I, as a layman, if I, I was not working on insect, if I go into the field, anything brown, I can say, hey, this is a stink bug. The other one is also stink bug, but one is pest, the other is predator, which is our friend. So why that is important? Because we don't want to kill our friend. We have to kill the pest. <laughs> Another challenge, the third challenge is intraclass dissimilarity. So we can have a same class, same species, but different patterns. And the fourth challenge is, in interclass similarity. So we have two different classes, but they're similar. So it's a Southern corn root plump, but we have been, uh, been leaf beetle. We have several examples where these insects are in different, uh, different species, different class, but they look similar. The fifth challenge is that we have diverse backgrounds and small foreground and variable el elimination. You can see some insects can be very teeny tiny like leaf hoppers, which are less than five millimeters. So they're they are very teeny tiny, they're green. So green on green, brown on brown. So that is the biggest challenge for the ML to solve. And these were the challenges when I was working with diseases too. Uh, so, and the four, the six challenges, the pest uh, orientation of pose. 
Butterfly can be open wing, it can be closed wing, broken wing, you know, caterpillar, there are different stages too. So we'll come uh, to that. So these challenges make this problem very interesting. The seven challenges that we have multiple insect pests in image frames. So we can have tons of uh, these uh, spotted lantern fly or aphids, which are very thin kind. Eight challenges, again, as I said, uh, background brown on brown, it can have a camouflaging effect of green on green. Last but not the least, this is the biggest challenge because in every class we have multiple stages. We can have a butterfly, we can have egg, larva, pupa, and so these uh, insects go through metamorphosis, so we can have various stages. So how to deal with that? So these are the questions uh, when, even when I was working with diseases, that how to overcome these challenges. One of the uh, biggest challenge was what is the data which will give me highest accuracy and the model which can work in wild. Another challenge is if you are using uh, self-supervised learning, what is the size of pertaining data? So which data set I should pick because there are so many open data set, which data to pick? And what is the depth of pre-training? Like how many times I should pre-train my model uh, to see? So other question is that, do we use in-domain data set or out of domain? Like we have ImageNet data, which is out of domain. There are ship images, line images. Can we use that data in plant science or not? Or do we need to have plant science data to make our model work best? And last but not the least is that can ML model gain user trust? Because if you are creating an app and farmer is using, and they're also using face tagging app to open their phone or something like that, it works perfectly. But if you're creating an app, if it doesn't work like that, they'll say, hey, I'm not gonna use, this is just rubbish app. So to answer that question, does the depth of retaining matters? So this question we wanted to know. So Shivani did a lot of uh, experiments to see uh, can she use one depth? So we, we, we say one depth means we are doing one level of pre-training using self surprise model. In this case, she used in-domain uh, data, uh, data set where we have no labels, all insect data set. And then she's uh, using, a, uh, she's doing fine tuning using a supervised cl classifier uh, with the less number of insects. Depth two is that we have two level of pre-training where depth one has weekly supervised pre-training and when I say this weekly supervised, it, they have used a swag model, which is uh, called supervised weekly hashtag. AG for swag, AG comes from hashtag. So this data set is a is, is, is huge data set, which has been re uh, uh, released by Facebook, Instagram, and it has been trained on 3.6 billion images. So the first pre-training was done on out of domain data set, which is ImageNet data set. And we use this, uh, yeah, we use the swag uh, uh, recipe. And then we are doing second level of pre-training using self-supervised uh, tra training using in-domain where we have all iNaturalist 13 million uh, images. And final uh, fine tuning we are doing using supervised classifier and we are using 6 million images again of insects, but with labels. So the, the middle one is with no labels and the last one is with labels. But the difference between that one and that two is there are two levels of pre-training in that two. So you see that the top one accuracy with depth one is 88.1 and top five is 96%. And with, top, uh, with depth two, the accuracy increases to 89.4 and 97.1. And I said, hey, it is just 1%. But 1% is a huge increase in accuracy when it comes to classification problem, especially 2,500 species with 6 million images or uh, yeah, 30 million images. Moving. Maybe click once on the slide. Yeah, maybe. Let's see. No. Yes. So the next question is, does the size of pre-training matters? So when we say pre uh, size of pre-training, it could be the data set which we are using in this middle step, self-supervised learning. So we used uh, this uh, for pre-training. We tried using 66K, 660K, 2 million, 6 million. So we wanted to see whether this data size matter when we are uh, pre-training in this uh, middle step. And we also tested two different architectures, ResNet versus RegNet, because one architecture is a, is a smaller architecture versus the bigger architecture, which is using more uh, parameters, which is RegNet. And we see when we are using ResNet, which is, uh, uh, which is like less powerful than RegNet, the accuracy uh, is like 98 or top five. And uh, 
also we are seeing as the data size is increasing, uh, our top one accuracy is also increasing. So the answer is, as we increase the data, uh, data size in pre-training, our accuracy increases. And as we move from a model or the architecture, which is uh, a less parameter with more parameter, our accuracy increases. So then when we got this uh, winner model, we decided that we will create a web-based app because we want to test it that whether it works in wild or not to uh, get rid of those challenges. So the winner model is a regnet model, which has been pre-trained uh, using 13 million images. Uh, and the training data size for the fine tuning is 6 million and number of insect species are 2,526 and mean per class accuracy is 95.5 and overall accuracy of the model is 96, which is huge if it, it works with 96% accuracy in wild. And as, as you can see that uh, the classes which have around 70% um, of the classes have accuracy of 100%, which is great. And then we have uh, classes uh, from 80 to 90% accuracy. And there are very less number of classes, which is less, uh, accurate, very less accuracy. Another uh, question was uh, that can we increase the accuracy of uh, the classes or the rare classes? Because it could be that the rare classes has uh, an invasive insect and we don't want false positives. So this work was done uh, in collaboration with another artist Singh from Carnegie Mellon, and she used AlphaNet. So basically what she was trying to do is, can she increase uh, the baseline accuracy? Uh, can, she in, can she increase the accuracy of these lower classes using AlphaNet without uh, reducing the overall accuracy? So when she uses AlphaNet, she increases the accuracy of few fewer classes with less than 80% accuracy to 87.6, which is around 88. And the over, overall drop in the accuracy is just 1.3%, which is not huge, and this is good. So we used AlphaNet to increase the accuracy of the rare classes. And now coming uh, back to the results. So when we see that these results, when I tested this app, it was crazy. I could not believe that this is happening. So the, the app can um, identify insects, even they are in a chemi camouflaging background, green on green, brown on brown. It can identify both male and female of a lot of the insects where they are uh, they have sexual dimorphism. The coolest example uh, which I jumped was when I saw that our app can even differentiate all the larval stages of the swallowtail butterfly. You can see these, uh, uh, these uh, larvae looks very weird and different and our app can identify them in different poses and orientations. It can ident identify multiple insects in frame. Again, uh, I didn't know about ladybird beetle, but when I went deeper into the data set, we came to know that our app can also identify intraspecies uh, dissimilarity. So this is a same uh, uh, insect, Harmonia exaridis, which is Asian lady beetle. It can have different patterns. For a human being, if I see these different kinds of insect, I'll say they are different insect, but the same insect. Our app can identify that with 98% accuracy. It can also differentiate between non-native versus predator species. Again, Harmonia exaridis looks pretty similar to Adelia bipunctata, which is two-spotted ladybird beetle. Again, both with 98% accuracy. And it can also differentiate these predator versus pest species uh, of this Harmonia, which somewhere like looks like this one, uh, and with Epilacna beetle uh, with 100% uh, accuracy Epilacna, and then uh, Asian beetle with 98 and again, as I said, these uh, interspecies uh, similarity of our app can also uh, identify that, hey, these two are two different insects. They are not same insect. And this one was uh, a very a big surprise to me because I was not hoping that our app can identify all the stages. So our app can identify the egg of monarch butterfly. It can identify the chrysalis, which is pupa, and it can also identify the caterpillars. And when I came, I was just looking for adult state, but I was in Farm Progress Show, one of the but Monarch Butterfly booth was there, and I was just showcasing our app, and this, this lady said, hey, do you want to test your app on this teeny tiny caterpillar? And I was so nervous because this was the first time we were showcasing our app to this, uh, to around, and this was the first biggest event too for the wire. And I was surprised that it, it was able to identify the teeny tiny caterpillar, which was in a Petri plate. There was shadow so much, but this, uh, this app worked. 
And also our app can identify these various invasive species which are on USDA website. From uh, a Japanese beetle, emerald ash borer, to these uh, uh, very, uh, uh, what do you call, not uh, common in our area, but during uh, big storms, uh, we uh, found that fall armyworm came to Iowa and this farmer said, hey, we don't even know how to identify this pest, which is not common for our area. Can your app or can machine learning identify? And he had a big episode where through storm, these invasive fall army, uh, this moth came into Iowa and uh, it started eating his alpha alpha. So our app can also identify this fall army worm uh, larva. So then it comes uh, that if we want to release this app to our stakeholders, it has to work with this high accuracy. So sometimes, uh, you know, because if it, it, it is not working, we lose the trust. So one th thing which we did with to gain that, uh, uh, what do you call, user trust, uh, can we apply these guardrails through uncertainty quantification? So basically what uncertainty quantification is doing is, it is seeing whether uh, this uh, a data set which we are trying to take an image, like is it out of distribution? For, or it is within the distribution of the training data set. If it is not within the distribution of training data set, it's, it says, hey, I'm uncertain, I'm not sure. So as soon as user is uh, taking a picture of this insect, which is not in training data set, it says the model has low, uh, low certainty on the inputted image. Do you want to continue? Because we really want, because this was happening in farm progress where these kids were taking image I say, hey, it is telling I'm a bumblebee, but I'm not a bumblebee, so, you know? So uh, with this guardrail, with this filter, they now know that uh, uh, this is, uh, we are making sure that, hey, our app knows that you are not an insect, but still it will give prediction, but it is telling uh, this uh, through pop-up menu that please proceed uh, with your own because I'm not certain about you. So as I said, it can uh, take image of flower. It will say, I'm not certain. With a kid, it says, I'm not certain. Or with a fish, it says, I'm uh, not certain. But then how, again, the question is, if uh, we have two very similar insect and uh, it again get confused because there it was happening when I was testing, this uh, Northern Conroot beetle looks very similar to another insect. And one was not in our data set. So it will always say what is closer in our data set that, A, it looked like cucumber beetle, but it is a northern corn root worm. So to get over that kind of confusion, uh, we uh, put another filter, which is known as conformal prediction. Basically, it is increasing the reliability of our app by telling that, hey, whenever I see maybe this cabbage looper, I am confident with 81% that this is cabbage looper, but I am getting confused like 19% with this gray looper moth. So this is what this uh, conformal prediction is doing. So with this app right now, we have a web-based uh, app. And right now we have, we, we quantize this model so that we can also put that in robots. Uh, so, and this work is done in collaboration with the Illinois University, where we are trying uh, to use these dexterous robots, which have an arm and they have a, a camera fingertip so that the when the robot is going into the plant canopy, it is just trying to look for the insect. And as soon as it looks into the insect, it the, another camera uh, just goes and takes the bigger image, high resolution image, and it keeps, uh, the image goes into the model and the model is calculating that how many insects I have seen in this area per square meter, maybe I have seen four. So maybe it's time to spray. So it, it this is called CPS loop where the, 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 the this, uh, Robot is sensing, it's also modeling, and it is trying to mitigate the stress by this actuation loop. And this is where we are working. And I guess I have an image. Uh, we were trying to see how we can deploy such image on our robot. So these students are trying, and in real time, they are seeing this is a Japanese beetle on a soybean leaf, and it tells that, hey, detected insect is uh, Popelia japonica. So this is where we are working to close the CPS loop. And this is part of uh, Shamik's project, which he's leading uh, the Frontiers project which Danny talked about. So now I'll change the gear from what we do uh, with our InsectNet, the app what, uh, which we have just released. Uh, this is a web-based app to what we are doing on another front of broadening participation. And this is uh, a topic which is very close to me uh, because this is what we started with Ira last year and it, the group is called Women in Ag and AI. So the main uh, goal of Women in Ag and AI is to increase a woman uh, participation in agriculture. Uh, so basically uh, we have women in agriculture 
uh, we have a very less women uh, who are working in agriculture and AI. So how we can increase uh, or broaden the participation of uh, women with a goal to increase their participation in AI applications in agriculture. So what this uh, group does is they, uh, they organize these um, th AI themed activities uh, from K-12 to you know, uh, undergrads, graduates and school level. And uh, this group consists of graduate students from agronomy and engineering. And uh, till now, uh, this group uh, has, uh, has been able to uh, work with around, around 11,000 stakeholders, including uh, farmers, including industry, including kindergartners, uh, including uh, uh, the middle schoolers uh, and high schoolers. And here you can see uh, when we started, we had a group of uh, 10 individuals. Uh, these are plant science um, uh, students and me here. And then these are the engineers. Uh, and oh, in last uh, one year, we have our group has increased to uh, 16. And this is me uh, talking to uh, the, one of the senators at ISUD at the Capitol. So basically, we are telling how cool uh, we what what cool work these women are doing, and agriculture is a cooler field now. It's not redundant, you know. Don't think. So basically, idea is to bring these uh, kids uh, interested to our work. They should know what we are doing in uh, uh, in our agriculture with all these cool AI tools. And this is an example where these students are showcasing the economics work to the Iowa Soybean Association. Uh, and these are like group of like 50 farmers coming from uh, various uh, counties in Iowa. And uh, another biggest event was in National Association of Plant Breeders meeting where we have uh, stakeholders from industry uh, and um, a lot of public and private industry. This, this was the biggest event where uh, we organized this event and we had uh, farmers, we had uh, kindergartners, we had middle schoolers. And, I, and in this event, uh, our VIA graduates were able to connect with uh, around 10,000 uh, stakeholders. So this was the biggest event which, which we did. And again, we do all these uh, various activities uh, where we try to showcase our tools and talk about how AI is going to help, help in, in agriculture in future. And here you can see that we are demonstrating AR VR system to uh, these uh, uh, business uh, undergrads. And this event we did for 4-H Youth Club. And this is uh, a very good event because uh, these ones are uh, the 4-H Youth Club leaders are attending. So they learn from us what we do, and then they grow and uh, teach the, these things to their group uh, members there. And one of the signature activities which we have made in our, um, this wire team is a rover building uh, using these Arduino boards. And uh, so this is uh, wire members learning that what they will do in uh, this training next day. And then we gave this training uh, of rover, rover building to these eighth graders. And this was a very uh, good hands-on experience of these eighth graders. And they, we, we came to know that these students are very much interested in uh, uh, you know, uh, coding and uh, robotics. So th this was very good experience. So we have made this activity as a signature activity. Uh, we are doing also this in our summer camps uh, uh, this uh, summer. And last but not least, this is uh, one of the recent activity which we did uh, in our elementary uh, grade. And this was a two hour thing and we connected with 200 uh, um, this, uh, elementary school kids. And there was tons of pa pa participation in this event. And this was very successful event uh, with our wire graduates. So as you can see, there are a lot of hand raised in this, these events. So, and as Danny was pointing out that we have also in IRA, we are trying to connect with a broader audience to making these videos. And this is one of the video which we have created for uh, for VIA. And I will just, just scroll it to a little bit, I'll show you, I won't. <laughs>
these uh, this these are the video which uh, students participated via, and they are talking about what they are doing with the various projects. So this is a better way we found to connect with our stakeholders. And I guess uh, this is the last uh, uh, slide or a video, which is on YouTube, which is uh, from my PhD student. And she's telling her journey that how she came in my program and how she wanted to be an engineer, but uh, coming in my program and she's now work, able to work with these all tools and AI. Uh, it's a very uh, inspiring uh, video. So I really, um, we have put this on YouTube. So to inspire more uh, women uh, out there, so. With this, I would like to uh, come to a stop and I would love to take your questions uh, if you have.